Jai Hind. Welcome to Jeff Dev Talk. This is Adi Achint. Today I have someone really, really special with me. This is the Prime Minister of the Government in Exile of East Turkestan, Mr. Saleh Hudayar. He's going to come and tell us what is happening in an occupied territory, an occupied country the Chinese are currently sitting on with the kind of things which happen and the kind of news that we get from that region of China, it is not something that we should take lightly. Sir, f first and foremost, thank you so much for joining me for the show and for taking out the time to tell us the story of East Turkestan. Thank you for having me. Sir, I don't uh, want to hold you back with regards to what you have to tell us. Uh, I want to know about the region itself, first and foremost. What Are there any people there currently who are in touch? Are there people who know what's happening in the outside world about them? What is spoken? What is it like in East Turkestan today, sir? Yes. Uh, firstly, uh, for much of the uh, Indian audience, first, uh, I want to explain uh, a little bit background on East Turkestan, the country, the people, and uh, briefly its history. Um, East Turkestan is the historical homeland of Uyghurs and other Turkic peoples. Uh, for over 6,000 years, Uyghurs and other Indo-European Turkic peoples have been uh, living in East Turkestan. Um, in fact, in ancient times, East Turkestan had a very uh, close relationship with India. Uh, we had a lot of cultural economic uh, exchanges. In fact, Buddhism uh, came from in India into East Turkestan before making its way from East Turkestan into, into China. Um, there are a lot of things that uh, we, we share with uh, India uh, that many people are unaware of. Um, and we've been the historical, you know, neighbors of India uh, since since ancient times. Um, in fact, historically, uh, India has never had a border with China. In fact, it does not have a border with China. It borders East Turkestan and uh, Tibet. Um, East Turkestan in the 1870s, in 1876, was invaded by the uh, Manchu Qing dynasty. Uh, and in 1884, it was incorporated into the Ch uh, Qing Empire as Xinjiang, meaning the, the new territory or the colony in the Chinese language. In the early part of the 20th century, uh, the people of East Turkestan declared their independence twice as the East Turkestan Republic, the first time in uh, November 12, 1933, and once more on November 12, 1944. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in 1949, uh, the Soviet Union uh, assisted the, the Chinese communists in not only taking over China, but also uh, in launching their invasion of East Turkestan. Uh, our senior military leaders and government officials, including our president, our general secretary, our interior minister, our uh, uh, chief of staff and our defense minister were called to a meeting in the Soviet Union and they were sub summarily executed. And later, the official narrative that the Soviet Union threw out was that they died in a plane crash. Furthermore, 30 senior other military officials of the East Turkestan Republic were killed, uh, thereby making it easier for the Chinese communists to invade East Turkestan. Um, in fact, uh, India uh, had a uh, consulate in Kashgar up until uh, the 19 mid 1950s i believe 53 uh and this was this was the case uh it, it after the chinese communists invaded east turkestan many of our uh people uh some fled to the soviet union others fled into india unfortunately at the time um the the group that fled into india uh they unfortunately you know did not stay in india Although the Indian government, uh, you know, requested that they stay in India and, you know, help them establish a community there. Uh, unfortunately, they decided to go to Turkey. And so we lost that uh, historic opportunity where in which we could have, you know, had uh, a, a successful thriving community in northern India, uh, like, uh, you know, our Tibetan uh, counterparts and mm. neighbors. Um, over the past Six, 73 years, the Chinese government has been 
effectively engaging in a campaign of extensive colonization, occupation, which has proliferated since 2014 into wholesale genocide of Uyghurs and other Turkic peoples. And uh, after one important thing that we forgot to mention is after the Chinese took over East Turkestan uh, in 1949, they also set their eyes on India. And in fact, uh, they you know invaded India in 1962 and occupied uh, uh, Eastern Ladakh or what is commonly known as Aksai Chen. Uh, so this is an important factor that many uh, Indians uh, you know, experts, they understand, but I think that the people themselves are still unaware that part of Indian territory is uh, under Chinese occupation. Uh, so getting back to the issue of the genocide, uh, it started in 2014 with the rise of Xi Jinping to power and the unveiling of the Belt and Road Initiative and China's, um, you know, Chinese dream of so-called national rejuvenation in which uh, initially they targeted young men or men between the ages of 15 and 45 on the basis that they were, quote, prone to become radicalized uh, and threw them into the concentration camps and prisons. After international silence, two years later, the Chinese government began to mass and turn the entire population of Uyghurs and other Turkic peoples. They began to, you know, put them into concentration camps or prisons depending on their level of, quote, loyalty or threat to the Chinese state. So they sent Chinese officials to live in the homes of Uyghurs to monitor their activities and to grade them on a level of, you know, uh, zero to 100. Um, and if you had lower than 90 points, in other words, if you were not nearly as perfect, you, had, you were deemed a threat and you had to be sent to uh, a camp. Or if you had a low score, you had to be sent to you know prison because there was no possibility of, quote, re-indoctrinating you or changing you or brainwashing you to become a loyal Chinese citizen. And in the process, over you know, 3 million, uh, at, at the very least, Uyghurs, Kazakhs, other Turkic peoples were sent to the concentration camps. Uh, with millions more in the prisons, the Chinese government in its own white paper in 2020 stated that between 2014 and 2019, uh, they sent 1.29 million people per year, or roughly 7.8 million people uh, over the course of six years into so-called vocational training centers uh, or re-education centers, which are the sick euphemism that the Chinese government uses to describe the concentration camps. And what we know about the camps is based on satellite imagery analysis, based on testimonies of some uh, camp victims that, you know, luckily had either uh, foreign citizenship or had, you know, foreign, uh, you know, uh, residency or family members that were in, you know, Western countries that were able to bring them out. Uh, and uh, along with Chinese government's own internal leaked documents and speeches made, made, uh, made by the Chinese government, along with, you know, leaked uh, videos and other things. In these camps, people are subject to, you know, torture, forced indoctrination for, you know, 18 hours a day. Uh, they're all living in very cramped conditions. They're forcibly medicated with unknown medication. They're forced to learn Chinese, to... Uh, you know, watch Chinese propaganda videos of Xi Jinping and memorize it. They're forced to denounce their own ethnic, cultural, and religious identity. And um, many of them, you know, especially the younger folks, they're, you know, they're selected and their organs are being harvested and sold as so-called halal organs to wealthy Muslims across the world. Uh, and there are deaths that are occurring in these camps. Uh, that are not being reported by the mainstream media. Um, and the deaths that are being reported are being described as, you know, deaths from tuberculosis or deaths from, you know, uh, other, other diseases. Or in the case in recent times, the Chinese government has been uh, letting go, freeing, releasing some of the detainees uh, that are at risk of dying. And after, 
a week or two, or in some cases, even within days of their release, they die. And so the Chinese government is, you know, freed from the guilt of, from the crime of, you know, killing those people uh, because they didn't die in, in Chinese government custody. So therefore, the Chinese government didn't commit that crime. When we all know that, you know, these people are being tortured, uh, they're bringing into a condition that is, you know, bringing them to the point of the, that they're going to die. And immediately, right when they know they're going to die, they're just releasing them and letting them die outside and saying, oh, they died on their own. Uh, these are all part of the atrocities. In addition to that, we have hundreds of thousands of Uyghur and other Turkic women who have been forcibly sterilized. Millions, according to the Chinese government's own data, over 3.7 million of our babies were forcibly aborted by the Chinese government in an effort to uh, prevent the growth of our population. At the same time, uh, they're forcing uh, young uh, Uyghur and other Turkic women to marry Chinese men. You know, if you're not, if you don't marry the Chinese man that the Chinese government wants you to marry, then you're going to be thrown into a camp. Your family members are going to be thrown into concentration camps. So they are being coerced in a systematic campaign of essentially what is state-sponsored rape uh, to marry Chinese men. So these are some of the atrocities. Uh, but all of this is defined as, you know, all of these crimes that the Chinese government is committing is uh, uh, are, are, are fit the definition of genocide as defined by the UN Genocide Convention. And as such, it has been recognized as genocide by the U.S. government, as well as the parliaments of nearly a dozen countries uh, in Europe and Canada. It's a, I mean, a s story that it's quite tough to swallow, sir, if I may say that. Uh, the main thing which which you've brought out, of course, is the is the attitude and the complicitness of the Chinese regime with regards to conducting these kind of activities. Uh, the main question that everyone would ask is that, you know, the population which is currently staying there, of course, has traditions, has values, has a whole lot of things going with regards to its ethnicity. How much are they actually are they actually allowed to follow as far as their culture is concerned sir well uh prior to you know 2014 there were limited aspects of our culture being you know uh, we were allowed to practice limited aspects of our culture uh, officially under china's so-called you know chinese law uh, we're a so-called autonomous region. The Chinese mm -hmm. calls East Turkestan the Xinjiang Uyghur autonomous region, meaning under the Chinese constitution, we're supposed to have, you know, ethnic and cultural rights to where we can, you know, practice our culture, our religion, our language, I mean, even our social and political life without, you know, uh, pressure from uh, and interference from the external or central government. Uh, but all of that is on paper. Um, in reality, uh, we have no rights whatsoever. Um, e as I said, even in the homes, if you are taught teaching your child your culture, Uyghur culture or Uyghur uh, identity or Turkic culture or identity or history, those are deemed as a crime as one of the reasons why you have to be sent to the concentration camps. Uh, in addition to that, they separated. This is, again, the Chinese government's own data. They forcibly separated 880,000 plus Uyghur and other Turkic children from their families because they weren't so-called loyal Chinese citizens. So they are taking them into essentially indoctrination camps for children in which the Chinese government likes to call uh, orphanages or uh, schools for children. And these orphanages and schools for children on the outside and inside are no different than the concentration camps, especially given the fact that they have barbed wire and high towers. What kind of school or orphanages looks like a prison, you know? But this is the sad case in East Turkestan. And from the videos that were uploaded by Chinese, you know, instructors, by the Chinese themselves, that they are promoting, you know, that they're cultivating a new generation of loyal Uyghur children, 
you see Uyghur kids, four years old, five years old, seven years old, being asked questions, you know, in Chinese, what are you going to be? What do you want to be when you grow up? Where are you from? What is your identity? And they respond, I'm Chinese. When I grow up, I want to be a, a soldier in the People's Liberation Army and defend the motherland. This is what they are cultivating. You know, this is what they are indoctrinating our children to be, to become, you know, Chinese machines, you know, essentially war machines that the Chinese will use in the future against not only our people, but against countries, you know, where ch that China wants to get in engage in conflict with, whether that's India or others. Uh, so these are all crimes that are, you know, happening uh, and that is, you know, not really being spoken of. The international community uh, is silent on this. Uh, many of them because of their economic or political or other ties with China are remaining silent. But they are failing to realize that by remaining silent, by, you know, thinking that, oh, if we don't, if we don't upset China for now, China will leave us alone. That is the biggest delusion. That is the biggest fallacy. You know, they're only fooling themselves. You know, when the, before the Chinese invaded East Turkestan, you know, they had already started their influence campaigns, their operations, yeah. you know, all these things that every power does before they invade the territory. And again, our leadership, our predecessors at that time were like, oh, you know, if, if we if we if we don't resist, if we don't, you know, if we try to negotiate with them, if we try to avoid conflict with them, we, we can save ourselves. 73 years later, what do we have? We went from over 95% of the population to less than 60% today. 60. The Chinese went, yeah, the Chinese went from less than 5% of the population in 1949, when after the Chinese communists invaded, to over 40% of the population today. And every day, they're systematically colonizing East Turkestan, bringing in, you know, Chinese colonists saying that they're going to help develop East Turkestan, to mm. modernize it. All the same things that they're doing with the Belt and Road Initiative in other parts of the, of the world. They're doing this in Pakistan. They're doing this in Africa. They're engaging in neo-colonialism. The Belt and Road infrastructure projects, all the things that, you know, the development that the Chinese are promising or the investment that the Chinese are promising, none of that is actually going to the local people. All of that, all of the employment is again being going to the Chinese and the Chinese are bringing their men and all of them are men. They're bringing men, giving them high salaries. And then on top of that, the local population there, in many cases in Africa and even Pakistan, you know, uh, you have impoverished people who are being, you know, ha who have no choice we're like, okay, well, my daughter will have a be better life, so sh she should marry a Chinese guy. This type of thing is happening, but they're not realizing that they're setting the stage for actual colonization and future, you know, occupation. Because slowly they're setting the seeds, you know, by injecting their people as so-called, you know, workers, laborers, when the African mm -hmm. people or the Pakistani people themselves are unable to find jobs. Uh, so these are these are all things I think uh, that is not just in the interest of the humanitarian aspect, but also in the interest of you know security aspects. China's Belt and Road Initiative it's not about so-called trade. On appearance, it's uh, it's about trade, but if you look at it, every major thing it's pre pre-war planning. The, the Chinese are planning for you know a future potential conflict. Essentially hegemony and they're trying to ensure that they succeed by planting you know by building these railways by building these airports by building these ports taking over the key you know uh points of entry and access in all of these you know influential countries in all of these strategic countries strategic locations that in the event that there is a war it can evade any you know potential blockades from you know Let's say the Quad, for example, if the the uh, the Quad was to block this, to issue a blockade in the Strait of Malacca, this is where Gwadar comes in. This is where East Turkestan comes in. The Chinese can evade that through their port in Gwadar, through their railways into Central Asia, through their pipelines into East Turkestan. 
and still be able to, you know, sustain their war efforts and expand. And mm. this is what it's about. Even the genocide of the Uyghurs, why it has rapidly, uh, you know, went from slow motion, you know, stimulation and colonization to wholesale genocide post-2014 is because they feel that East Turkestanis are a huge strategic risk to China's, you know, uh, potential security and war uh, and um, efforts to sustain a war in the event that it gets into a larger conflict with w- whether it's the United States over Taiwan or India over, you know, border issues uh, regarding uh, uh, Eastern Ladakh or other territories that the Chinese are trying to encroach on. And so that's why initially they targeted men between the ages of 15 and 45, those of military age, to gauge the reaction or the lack of reaction, how the international community would react. And they said, oh, we're fighting against terrorism. And the international community stood silent. And after that, they're like, okay, well, this doesn't, they didn't say anything to this. So let me just use the same excuse to round up millions of more people and remove this you know, so-called security risk because they fear that East Turkestan and independent East Turkestan would ultimately, you know, erode, stop its Belt and Road Initiative mm. deep right there. It would stop China's imperialist ambitions. It would kill, you know, the Chinese dream. And so that's why they are so heavily focused on completely eradicating uh, East Turkestan and its people, not just, you know, its culture and history, but physically, you know, engaging in genocide, killing part of our population, enslaving another part of our population, and forcefully, you know, breeding out the remainder of our population to where in 20, 30 years, there will be no Uyghurs left if, if it continues at this rate. You said that this story started to accelerate beyond 2014 and you've explained to us why as well. Uh, I want to know that what is the role of Xi Jinping? So what was, what is it that they suddenly realized they had to do in East Turkestan that they hadn't realized before? What is the reason of the, the, the sudden rush? Well, the, the Chinese, I mean, they're, since they invaded East Turkestan in late 1949, they immediately, you know, knew before they even invaded East Turkestan, they knew there was going to be a, quote, security risk, given the fact that, you know, there's no Chinese in East Turkestan. Um, in fact, it was the Soviets, it was Stalin who, you know, persuaded Mao to take over East Turkestan because uh, if we, if we, if East Turkestan had been incorporated into the Soviet Union, that would have meant that we would border India, which is still, which still has considerable at that time in the 1940s, still had considerable British influence. So they didn't want, you know, East Turkestan to be uh, used, uh, you know, uh, to put pressure on the Soviet Union. So Stalin advised Mao and supported Mao in taking over East Turkestan. In fact, it was Stalin who said, you need to, you know, raise up, you know, mass colonize this region to where at least 30 percent of the population is chinese to where you know the indians and the british won't be able to you know uh, use this region to potentially put pressure on you or or me and because there's natural both on like soviet union and china uh and because there's a lot of natural and mineral resources you know that that will be useful for you and me and me you need to take over this region and that's what that was the case. However, um, and China has always been wary about East Turkestan's independence. However, what really changed is, you know, since the early 2000s, the Chinese government, uh, as China is growing, you know, economically and politically, it has, you know, historic ambitions. It wants to, you know, take over Taiwan. It wants to expand its, you know, borders to what it views as the real China. Uh, in its own, you know, uh, false narratives that uh, imperialist narratives that it has shaped up. And so to advance that, um, you know, it has to act and prepare militarily. And that means, you know, starting preparation now. And part of that means taking out, you know, 
you know, any potential risks, uh, you know, eroding, making sure that there's no uh, any potential risks that you could encounter. And the biggest risk to China is East Turkestan, which they have already realized because unlike, you know, other areas, East Turkestan is still heav heavily Turkic. Still the Turkic population are still the majority by margin, barely. Um, but there is also a willingness by the Turkic peoples there to, you know, reestablish their independence. And it borders, you know, 10 different countries, including India, uh, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Russia, Tajikistan, all these different countries. Really? So Central it's, country. Mm. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a, of strategic importance for China in that regard. And so as they are making their war planning strategy, they realized it was actually a Chinese... Uh, his current general in 2009, he gave a, a three-hour lecture at China's National Defense University on the potential conflict between the United States and China in 2030. And he said, right now, the biggest weakness that we have, that the Chinese have, is that if we are to engage in you know, a, a larger conflict, whether it's over Taiwan or whether it's over some other issue with the U.S., the U.S. could easily arm 300,000 to half a million Uyghurs overnight, and they could cut off our west to east pipelines and energy grids, and we would be unable to sustain that war. We would lose. And he said, for this reason, this is the biggest threat to us. And this is why we have to ensure we have to act swiftly to eradicate this threat. And that's essentially what they have been doing, is following that you know, urgency because Dictate. Mm. China China is growing more and more powerful day by day. It's economically, politically, and militarily powerful to where if the, if China tried to do this 30 years ago, let's say in the 1980s, it would have it, it would have had it would have received a, a larger pushback not only internally from East Turkestan, uh, you know, from East Turkestan. Uh, inside of East Turkestan, but externally from other nations. Uh, they would ex exploit this. And now China is, you know, like the upper dog in many of their relationships uh, as the bigger stick or the bigger end of that relationship in many of the countries and the relationship that it has with many of the countries, with much of the international community, because all of them are either economically or politically reliant on China. So if China engages in, engages in genocide, they're not going to do anything. We see it. You know, no one's doing anything about it. You have some Western countries who are in, quote, competition with China, who are, you know, speaking out against the, quote, human rights atrocities and, you know, giving lip service to, you know, recognizing it as a genocide, but it's stopping there. There's no meaningful action being done. You see the international community's response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Mm. I immediately, they're all they're all you know acting against Russia's invasion of Ukraine, yet they are staying silent to China's ongoing genocide in East Turkestan, despite the fact that they recognize it as a genocide, despite the fact that they know the atrocities and they know that it's not going to stop there. East Turkestan is just for now. After China finishes East Turkestan. You bet they're going to do the same thing to other parts of the world that they plan to invade. They've already made it. You had Chinese ambassadors to the France make it quite clear that after they invade Taiwan and take over Taiwan, the first thing they're going to do is put people in the concentration camps, put them into so-called re-education. Re-education camps. Yeah, you know, the, these are not, they're, they're no longer hiding their t intentions anymore because they feel comfortable. They feel um comfortable with their position uh, because again no one no one's opposing them mm. challenging them and so they they feel that they can get away with it and unfortunately to a larger extent they have been getting away with it the trouble with china is that it when it gets challenged from one area it shifts focus towards the other and it's got so many battles going around all over the place so it's always got an opportunity to cool down one place and go to the next and you know, it's, it's like their gray zone tactic. Just keep it short of war. Uh, exactly. And, and even with the whole issue of, you know, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I mean, 
Xi Jinping, uh, Putin went to Xi Jinping, got Xi Jinping's approval, and after that launched the you know invasion of Ukraine. Um, China wants you know Russia to continue its invasion of Ukraine to continue this war because it's in China's benefit because it puts off pressure, you know, mm-hmm. the global attention away from China. The real long-term threat that everyone acknowledges, everyone. Whether it's the West, whether it's India, whether it's, you know, Japan, whether it's, you know, even African countries, they all acknowledge China is the long term threat. But because of temporary, you know, greed is what I I think it is. Temporary greed by corporations, multinational corporations, they're failing to act against that. And China is exploiting this factor by, you know, supporting Russia and trying to, you know, continue the, the, the the, the war that's happening in, 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 on the uh, steps of Europe. It's to a good diversion for China. To divert the tension. And, it's and a, yeah, exactly. I was saying that it's a good diversion for China. So coming back to Xi Jinping and uh, the, the timeline for China to do all these activities was set previously by Deng Xiaoping at 19, uh, 2049 at the hundred years until then he had said kind of hide your strength bide your time of course the literal chinese translation means something else but in in in, in the core strength of it today china has taken up issues with all countries around it and within itself has got problems in east turkestan and of course the the region of tibet where i believe that they they are starting to do what they are what you describe they did in your country in the sense you can see the tightening up happening with uh, the the Dalai Lama issue and all that stuff. My question to you about the region is that East Turkestan as a country had relations of course with India and it's a it's a clear thing that we we fell short in that aspect of it. What about the other countries in the region? Is there a voice within the local the, the, the neighboring countries within the extended neighborhood in the Middle East uh, Russia, of course, will not say much. Uh, how about Mongolia? And is there voices coming out of there of support or of any kind of help? Unfortunately, not. Um, and again, this is because many of those countries uh, have, you know, especially like the landlocked countries like Mongolia, Central Asia, they're all landlocked regions. And they too are caught in between two empires, the Russian Empire and the Chinese Empire. And so they have, they're acting in their, in their own selfish interests, trying to preserve their existence. And that means, you know, staying silent on, on, on to us. And that's what they think is beneficial is just by staying silent, they, they can buy their time. But in reality, by staying silent today, like it's, they're coming for East Turkestan. Once they finish and swallow up East Turkestan and digest it, then they will move into Mongolia. They, they, all of this is no secret, you know, even into Central Asia, even into the northern parts of uh, India, like the Chinese, they have this delusional map that they that they created in the 1930s or 40s, saying that these are the historical Chinese territories. And, you know, once China grows powerful, we're going to reclaim all this. Uh, this stretches off even into Afghanistan. So all of this, you know, all of these countries right now, they are staying silent. They are falling into the same traps that China laid out for East Turkestan. And if they are not looking at East Turkestan and realizing that they will become next, then woe to them. I mean, they are essentially, you know, walking into the same trap despite trap. seeing the warning signs. And that's the that's the, the, the biggest uh, case. I mean, with our case, you could say, oh, there was no warning, you know, or whatnot. I mean, there was historical warnings, but recently there was no warnings warning us. Oh, don't you know? Don't fall for the Chinese tricks. You could say that, but now you see what's happening. You see how the Chinese operate. You're seeing how they're implementing, you know, uh, their imperialist agendas. Yet you're still cooperating with them. And what's shameless is like the Central Asian countries or the Muslim countries, like. In East Turkestan, you have Uyghurs, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, and other Turkic peoples. Yeah. They are also being equally persecuted. They are also facing genocide. 
Yet the governments of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, others, Uzbekistan, they're remaining silent because, again, of the greed. They're sacrificing their future for the temporary economic gains that they can get by doing, you know, trade with China. And they're not realizing that. The Chinese are laying out the trap for them, you know, saying, oh, we're going to help you build new ports. We're going to help you build new airports. We're going to help you build new roads. Let's build a railway from, you know, Xi'an all the way to Tashkent. And these countries are like, oh, okay, if that's going to, you know, improve trade, let's do it. They're not realizing that, you know, part of that is not just for trade in mind, but for military maneuverability in the future. It's logistics. China is logistically setting itself up to expand further, to envision its, you know, imperialist agenda that it had laid out almost a century ago, right after it became, you know, declared itself as the Republic of China under the Chinese nationalists. Um, it's, it's sad. The Muslim world, they're all complicit in many ways. They've deported Uyghurs uh, and sent them back, knowing that they're going to be executed, knowing that they're going to be, you know, yeah. prisoned. Uh, Pakistan is probably the worst. I mean, it's a neighboring country, but even if we try to flee there, uh, they'll shoot us on spot on the border uh, yeah, because yeah, of their yeah. uh, agreement with, with the Chinese. Um, even, you know, countries like uh, Turkey, uh, which, you know, is a part of NATO. Uh, that was, yeah. is a NATO member. It's, uh, I mean, it, it has cultural, economic, and historical ties with East Turkestan. But even they are, you know, cooperating with China in terms of intelligence and military cooperation to, you know, facilitate, one, to help China find the justification to facilitate the ongoing genocide by sending, you know, Uyghurs into Syria um, and portraying, you know, Uyghurs as so-called Islamists and terrorists to give China the justification to engage in the genocide by pointing to such such Uyghurs in Syria. Um, at the same time, um, you know, they're doing everything that they can uh, to undermine our, uh, you know, national independence movement. You know, um, they're playing a lot of uh, games to, you know, undermine our own government in exile here. And despite that, the fact that we're based in Washington, D.C., the, the Turks, they have a lot of influence. Uh, 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 Turkish government has a lot of influence in uh, gl our global diaspora communities because, again, we are people foolishly think, you know, they're Turkish, we're Turkic, you know, we're brother nations, so they will they will help us. And they will, you know, make sweet, sweet promises, you know, They'll be like, oh, inshallah, mashallah, even Erdogan before he went and signed a, a, you know, a strategic cooperation agreement and intelligence and security cooperation. You know, he paid lip service saying, oh, what the Chinese are doing to the Uyghurs is like genocide. Then not even 12 months later, he's like, China is our, our best ally. We will, you know, we view China's security as our security. It's insanity. I mean, if I may say the say the least, there's there's no no other word about about that. So, lastly, you know, uh, you what is it that you are planning to do? What do you do in terms of bringing awareness? I'm sure that's one of one of the major things that you're doing. Uh, interestingly speaking, and happily speaking, a lot of people have started talking about. The issues which are happening in East Turkestan, the, the the concentration camps and the so-called re-education camps and the organ trade and this and that, which is taking place, people have started talking about it. These are today mainstream knowledge, uh, and I am sure a lot of the credit would go to people outside the country today trying to educate people around the world. What is it that you envis envisage doing? to kind of help the situation going forward into the future? Well, for us, there's only one solution, and that is to restore East Turkestan's independence because uh, we've already had, you know, we've been a so-called autonomous region since 1955. And autonomy has brought us nothing but colonization and genocide. Um, even if China, even if we were to wait for China, if we were somehow magically survived, you know, and were magically China became a democratic country. 
there is no guarantee that we will have our freedoms or rights. In fact, we had Chinese democracy leaders based here in, in the United States who, you know, were upset with the U.S. recognizing the genocide and who threatened that, you know, who threatened openly on social media that if, you know, the Uyghurs try to push for independence, they will face a real genocide and not even their American friends can stop them. So this is the reality of the the chinese you know even they're not uh their so-called dem democratic leaders uh want to completely occupy colonize and eradicate our population so for us restoring our independence is the only solution and we are running out of time we maybe have a decade of you know a window of opportunity to reverse the current situation and in this regard um, and this is not just for us as well. This is also a decade of opportunity for other nations to, you know, to finally put an end to the Chinese global efforts to, you know, obtain global hegemony. Um, because if, if, if this thing goes on, if China continues to grow at its current rate, uh, you know, unopposed, unchallenged, then... China will become the glo global hegemon and it will easily be able to roll into Central Asia, into, you know, South South Asia, into Northern India, into other parts of the world and, you know, be, be virtually unopposed. Um, and some of the policymakers might, you know, do the same mistakes that we did back in 1949 and that our predecessors, are not our necessarily our predecessors, but some of the people in East Turkestan made. Uh, in 1949 by, you know, saying, oh, if we resist, well, you know, it'll be too costly. So let's just concede and let's try to, you know, work out a negotiated settlement. And that negotiated settlement has resulted in us being colonized, in us facing genocide to where in the next 10, 15 years, we will cease to exist. So in this regard, we are, you know, raising awareness about the atrocities in East Turkestan trying to get governments to uphold their commitments under international law, but also explaining the threat of China to their own national security. For example, China is a big threat to India's national security. But an independent East Turkestan and an independent Tibet would guarantee 100% that India would no longer have a threat, a China threat. And India, you know, East Turkestan is rich in natural and mineral resources. What's empowering China is East Turkestan's natural and mineral resources, the energy, the, the oil, the natural gas, the electricity, all of that, all of these are resources that India too needs. And India is trying to, you know, find, you know, build pipelines through Afghanistan, through all these different places to, to get, you know, an energy resource that it needs for its future, you know, growth. When in reality, in reality it could have a less costly and less costly, you know, way of getting that energy through East Turkestan. One, ensuring its own energy security. Two, ensuring its own territorial security by having East Turkestan and Tibet as a buffer against, you know, China. Because China is not, even if by taking away East Turkestan uh, and restoring East Turkestan's independence and Tibet's independence, you're still going to have a massive Chinese state, which is still going to be, you know, is not going to let go of its expansionist uh, you know, tendencies that it has. It's still going to try to cross, cause, you know, uh, geopolitical uh, problems. So it, it, East Turkestan is the all-in-one solution in independent East Turkestan. It's mutually beneficial to ensure, you know, it's the morally correct thing to do to save a nation from, you know, being eradicated. It's also the politically correct thing to do. And it's a strategic thing to do, you know, to ensure peace and stability in the Eurasian continent. Absolutely, sir. There's no question about that because at the end of it, uh, uh, negotiating with a hegemon does not work. And uh, a hegemon which does not talk about multipolarity as the today, today what the Chinese keep touting about, if I may, uh, but it's, it's global dominance. And that's the achievement of a interesting term called Ba, which is the world hegemon which is what the Chinese want to be. So just, you know, I'm going to ask you one small little question. How many ethnic uh, Turkic people would be there? Or what would be the, you know, you you, you said there, there are multiple ethnicities within East Turkestan. 
how many people would be there of these multiple ethnicities which originally belong to East Turkestan today in the country? Sir? So in East Turkestan, um, East Turkestan is, let's also talk about the size of East Turkestan. East Turkestan is 1,828,418 square kilometers. Uh, which is roughly one-fifth of the present territories of the so-called People's Republic of China. Uh, it's three times the size of Ukraine. Uh, so in, in a geographic perspective, it's a very large country. Very large. Population-wise, uh, we estimate that East Turkestan's true population, not including the Chinese colonists, is about 45 million And prior, prior to 2016. Um, and we base this on historical population data from the 19, uh, early 1900s all the way till 1949 and, you know, at a normal uh, growth rate of 2.5%, uh, as well as uh, the Chinese government's own statements. For example, in 2018, they reported they collected the DNA samples, voice prints and retina scans of 36 million non-Chinese or so-called ethnic minorities, which means non-Chinese peoples between the ages of 12 and 65 in East Turkestan. So if there's 36 million between the ages of 12 and 65 who are non-Chinese, our total population would probably be around 45 million around that time. Right now with the ongoing genocide and their, you know, secretive campaigns to kill Uyghurs through, you know, tuberculosis and other biological means, we, we don't really know. But that was our assessment prior to 2016. Um, there are around 15 million Chinese colonists and their soldiers. Most of them actually uh, uh, work for the Chinese government uh, and their colonial apparatus called the Bingtuan, which is a, a paramilitary force exclusively set to, col you know, established in 1954 to colonize East Turkestan. At present, uh, East Turkestan's, you know, True native people of East Turkestan are Uyghurs, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, Uzbeks, Tatars, and other, you know, Indo-European peoples. Uh, the Chinese, you know, they were sent to colonize East Turkestan after the Ch uh, Manchu Qing dynasty invaded and occupied East Turkestan. Prior to that, there was no, you know, Chinese presence in East Turkestan. Or that Chinese presence was limited to, you know, business, you know, merchants, you know, because we're on the Silk Road, so you'll have Chinese merchants, you know. Uh, coming and going just like we have, you know, Uyghurs and other Turkic merchants in, in China's, you know, various Chinese cities engaging in business. Uh, but there is no settled Chinese population in East Turkestan until after the uh, Manchus invaded and occupied East Turkestan. And in 1949, for example, the Chinese didn't make up even 5% of the population. That's including the invading Chinese army and their, you know, oh. family they didn't even make up five percent of the population by 1960 the chinese had raised it to over you know nearly 30 percent of the population um and then or gradually over the past several decades they've you know engaged in slow motion colonization and assimilation policies but since 2014 it has proliferated to where our own people in the next you know decade we we are at a risk of becoming a minority in our own country. For example, the Uyghurs, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, Uzbeks, Tatars, if combined right now, we are still the majority, uh, roughly about 55 to 57% of the population. Whereas the Chinese are about 41%. In the next decade, we fear that it will be, you know, complete opposite if something doesn't happen. Um, and if, and within two decades, you know, the Chinese will have systematically assimilated much of our people, eradicated the majority, and within 30 years, we won't even exist as a people. That's the sad reality that we are facing with. We are really, you know, facing a life and death situation you know, where the only thing that can guarantee our existence is our own independent, you know, restoring our own independent state. There's no doubt about that. And, you know, uh, ethnicity and this and that needs to get respected. And at the end of it, these are ancient traditions which have been going on for hundreds and thousands of years, which which carry on. Uh, you mentioned something really interesting. And first of all, sir, let me just, you know, pay my respect and gratitude to you that you've taken out the time 
to talk to me. And uh, just as a wrap up, you mentioned something really interesting about the pro democracy forces in China or outside China. Funnily speaking, they also claim Eastern Ladakh. So I, I know what you what you're saying. They also claim the state of Arunachal, which is an integral part of our country. So yeah, it's it's quite a hot hodgepodge sort of an affair as far as the Chinese are concerned, and on both sides of the fence, there is there is no question about that. It's a sad story, so if I may, and words will not be enough to describe what you've just told us. A lot of it, of course, is known, and but to hear it from someone who belongs to that region is a different uh, journey altogether, and it's a different learning experience. As I said, so I'm grateful that you've taken out the time, and I uh, hope we have been in touch for a while. Uh, I hope we can stay in touch and probably do some more programs so that we could spread the message within India a little further. And uh, I will also try and see if I can get you involved within certain groups so that we can talk more and develop, uh, you know, sort of informal relations between uh, the two people. Thank you so much for joining me, sir. It's, it's, it was a learning experience and a, a, quite a heart-wrenching experience listening to your story, sir. Thank you for having me and giving me this gracious opportunity to highlight the plight of East Turkestan and its people. Thank you, sir.